We will begin with the presentation of the, Z of the Zlatowski Admission Awards for Outstanding Students, followed by a great lecture, What Have We Learned in Recent Years About the Universe, that will be given by Professor Sylvia Torres Paimbert, a world-renowned astronomer. I would like to begin by addressing the recipients of this year's Zlatowski Admission Award for Outstanding Students. This award is given only to the very best new students at BGU based on the average of their matricul matriculation exam scores and their psychopathic, I mean psychometric exam scores. <laughs> this, is, this is a personal opinion about the meaning of these scores, not the matriculation exams. I'm sure you guys did really well. This year, the award was granted to a total of 143 students. Zlotowski students consistently prove that their award is well-deserved they have maintained the highest grades at the departmental and faculty levels and often receive additional prizes for outstanding achievements. The percentage of Zlatowski students who pursue graduate degrees at BGU is significantly higher than that of other students. It's my pleasure to ask the students receiving, representing, representing this year's Zlatowski Admission Award recipients to stand up and be recognized. We have only, we have two recipients today who will speak on behalf of the larger group, uh, Moran Shomshila and Rivka Shitrit. I would now like to ask Moran and Rivka to join me on, join me on stage for a few words. President Rivka Karmi, Adeline and Louis Lotowski, members of the Board of Governors, dear friends, shalom. My name is Moran Shomshila and this is Rivka Shitrit. We are proud and honored to stand here and represent the BGU students who received the Zlotowski Award for Outstanding Students this year. I am 24 years old and was born and raised in Beersheba. I am a first year student in the tunneling program, a new dual BSc program at the Departments of Construction, Engineering and Geology. This program collaborates with the Israel Railways and the Ministry of Transport. My name is Rivka Shitri. I am 24 years old and was born and raised in Jerusalem. I am a first year medical student at BGU. After graduating high school, I served as an officer in the IDF A200 unit of the Intelligence Corps for more than five years in several roles, including Commander of Electronic Intelligence Course, Commander of the Intelligence Officers Course, and <coughs> Intelligence Cyber Investigator. My Army service was the most meaningful period of my life. I managed to overcome many challenges and prove to myself that I, that I can do anything. I am deeply connected to Be'er Sheva, and I cannot see my future in any other place. My connection to the city and the Negev region was one of the reasons that made me choose to study at BGU. BGU promotes young women to study engineering and science and does everything to help us succeed. When I was in high school, I heard President Rivka Karmi speak about female leadership. I was very impressed that she is the first female president of an Israeli university. She inspired me to study here. I hope to inspire other young women to study science. I believe this field will help them join the world of research and employment, which until not so long ago was strongly dominated by men. I am proud to be a part of the BGU family. My biggest wish is to promote and develop the Negev as an engineer. I grew up in a religious family. After high school, I did an army preparatory program 
where I volunteered with the elderly and with underprivileged children. It was important for me to serve in the army and to encourage other religious women to follow in my footsteps because this is still not the norm. I serve in a special program that makes it easier for us to serve in the IDF while maintaining our religious lifestyle. I was an officer in the education corps, working with kids at risk in a lot and helping them prepare for their army service. I tried to be a role model to them and encourage them to contribute in their own way. Although I was accepted to other universities, I chose to study medicine here at VGU because of the Goldman Medical School's human approach. Here, they train us not just to be doctors, but to become social activists. We learn to respond not only to the needs of the patient, but to the needs of his family and the community as well. I volunteer with my fellow students counseling teenagers on sexually transmitted diseases and healthy sexuality. I also volunteer at Med School for All, an organization that makes med school more accessible for applicants. We run free preparatory courses for young people from low socioeconomic backgrounds from all over Israel who want to get into med school to help increase their chances of getting in. On behalf of all Zlotowski students, both female and male, I would like to say toda to dear Susie Zlotowski and to Adeline and Louis Zlotowski who are with us here today. Susie's strong support of the Zlotowski students let us choose BGU and realize our dreams here. Thanks to your empowerment, we promise to make our own contribution to Israel and the world. Susie Adeline Veloui Eikari, Beshem Kol Mekablot U Mekablei Fras Zlotowski, Toda Shenatatem Lanu Eta Izdamnut Lilmod Universitat Ben Gurion Banegev. Bizkut Mikatrem, if any of you weren't aware, we have great students. <laughs> Thank you, Moral and Rivka. I would like to proceed to the second half of our program and call upon Professor Rami Brustein, head of the Department of Physics, who will introduce our lecturer for today, Professor Silvia torres Pamba. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy that a uh, part of the Board of Governors events is a lecture in cosmology, and I'm particularly happy that the lecturer is, is Professor Silvia torres Pembert sitting here with us. We had a little bit of a problem setting up the presentation, but I'm sure the wait was worthwhile. Uh, Professor Torres is a leading astronomer. She studied her, she did her undergraduate studies in Mexico and went on to do a PhD at Berkeley and decided after finishing her PhD to come back to Mexico to say a sensation that many of us Israelis recognize and understand the challenge in this choice. Uh, she did very well. She made the important contribution to astronomy, in particular chemical composition of the universe, which is part of an important part of understanding the history of our universe uh, and was recognized for her achievements in several awards, including the uh, Mexican National Science Prize, 
the Laurel UNESCO Prize for Women Scientists in Latin America, and the Hans A. Bethe Prize of the American Physical Society. She took on, as time passed, leadership position at UNAM, her institution in Mexico. And uh, today, she will tell us about recent developments in understanding the universe, and we all look forward for a wonderful lecture. Silvia, bienvenida. I am very honored to be here, to be here be, being presented with this uh, award, and to be here giving this Lovoski lecture for you. I'm sorry that uh, there were problems, but there are always problems in life, and we have to go ahead and, and survive through them. The, the topic that I chose was I started thinking about the universe, and then I realized that I wanted to tell you all uh, that a lot of things, uh, exciting things, are happening in astrophysics. The astrophysics is a, a science that is very much alive, and these uh, recent years have brought up lots of surprises and interesting results. I will not talk about all the many results that are happening, I will talk about some of the selected ones that I found very exciting that I, I want to share with you. And let's see if I can manage to, to do that. So three topics of I will talk, and I will talk about gravitational waves. They were predicted by uh, 100 years ago by Albert Einstein, and uh, in the general relativity uh, results, there was the, 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 there was the prediction of the, of the gravitational waves. Well, they have been looked for for 50 years very, ser uh, very seriously, and only recently through uh, the LIGO, uh, I, will, I will show you what it means, uh, the, the acronym, which are two interferometers at four kilometers long, each one of them, uh, and uh, they're located in the United States. One is in, in the Northwest, and uh, in Hanford, Hanford, and the other one is in South, in, in Louisiana. And they detect that they're uh, 2,500 miles uh, 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 separated, uh, 4,000 kilometers, and uh, they detected the same signals that were matched. One of the, the top one was detected by the North and the Northern detector, the, the lower one and saw the detector, and they happened to match, uh, to be the same signals. And uh, they're, they're shown here. I'm going to go very uh, quickly. And uh, they were uh, detected on September, uh, on September 14th. They were, detector, uh, they were detected. And they, they, they the, they, the, there was a difference on the detection of seven milliseconds from one detector to the other, and then they, this difference can be explained that the source of the, of the signal is located in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the explanation of the signal is that it was, it's the production, they were produced, the, 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 the waves were produced during the final fraction of a second of the merger of two black holes that were producing a single, more massive black hole. The two black holes are small in the sense that they are not these enormous black holes, but they are solar black holes, uh, stellar black holes, one 29 and the other 36 times the mass of the sun. And it's, so, it's such an energetic event that to, to be able to see it is that we are looking at uh, uh, an, an event that took place in the past at 1.3 billion years ago. Uh, the, uh, the event the, an, annihilated three times the mass of the sun who, that were converted into gravitational waves in the fraction of a second. So I think uh, everybody was expecting this result. We were all excited about it, and I think this was an event that shook all the astronomers. Uh, 
It, it was carried out by the physicists, but they really, it's an astrophysical result altogether. I must, I must say that. And, and one of the uh, our members here has participated. A, a lot of the physicists have worked on the, uh, on the gravitational wave problem for many years. And well, this is finally the result. This is a, a description of the two uh, black holes that, that merge. And for the future of this kind of result, this is a new astronomy that's opening up its, its doors. And the, the, in, in a few years, maybe in six years, there will be a, an enormous network of uh, detectors of this size. And I'm sure they will be able to find many, many more events like this. Uh, with the detectors, they did not expect to find such uh, 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 an event, and it was found even before the detectors were put into operation, when they were testing them. So it's a very, an extremely exciting result. I couldn't help talking about it to all of you. Now, changing gears, I want to talk about other kind of events. Exoplanets. What, are, what am I talking about? Planets that are around other stars other than the sun. We're talking about other solar systems, other than our own. And for this, the, these planets also follow Kepler's law. And I always tell, my, tell the people, and I'm sure I can show the same, that you were all taught Kepler's law in, in high school. You already forgotten them, but they still work. Uh, <laughs> even if you have forgotten them. The, uh, it, it says that the orbits of the, of the planets are in a plane. They are, the, plane the, the orbits are elliptical. The sun is in one of its foci. Uh, the, the planets go around the, the ellipse in, and, re, and cover equal areas in equal times. And uh, there's a relation between the periods and the size of the orbits. And this would be an example of two orbiting bodies. These are two stars, but this is the same uh, idea, that both stars are moving around each other. They are moving around the center of mass. And of course, this happens uh, when the stars are of similar size, the orbits are of similar size. When the stars are of very different size, like a star and a planet, the, 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 the main body hardly moves. It just slightly wobbles, like, like this girl. To, to move the hoop, she has to slightly move, uh, slightly move. So what were we, how do our exoplanets detected? They are detected by the motion of the star. And this motion of the star is detected by the Doppler effect which we listen when there's an ambulance that is approaching or receding. We can listen that in the sound waves. Of course, we cannot listen that in the light waves because for that, uh, the speed is much higher and, and our, our eyes cannot detect the difference. But here's a representation of these same two stars uh, that we would be looking at them. And what we see is that the lines, the absorption lines shift uh, according to their motion and according to whether they're approaching or receding, each one of them would shift. When we have a planet instead of two stars, the planet has no, uh, is so faint in comparison to the star that we don't see the planet. We don't see this motion of the planet. What we see is the motion of the star, the, the little wobble of the star in response to the motion of the planet. And this is what was, so, what was found only 20 years ago, 20 years is a very short time span in the humanities uh, time uh, scale. And it was the first detection of an extrasolar planet. When the authors came out with this result, nobody believed them. And, on, and then until other authors, other astronomers tested this result, then of course it came out that it's right, that there are other planets around stars. So this was a result 20 years ago. Most of the planets that are found are similar to Jupiter because they are bigger. And then, of course, the motion of the, 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 the corresponding motion of the star is, is more significant. 
when uh, for for a uh, star uh, planet like the Earth, the motion is very very uh, sig uh, insignificant. It's almost unperceivable. So it's very difficult to find uh, Earth-like planets. On the other hand, if we have uh, Jupiter-sized planets, the trouble about them is that they don't have a solid crust. We and and what what I'm what am I getting into? We're looking for planets that might harbor life. And so in that sense, we would like planets that have a solid crust, that maybe have water and other peculiarities. So those are the ones that are being looked for. But also, uh, people are looking for multiple planets. So it's fine. It's possible to find multiple motions around the star. Uh, for the star because uh, they're responding to multiple planets. And indeed, this has been found, at least in many places, but this is an example, Upsilon Andromeda, a star with several planets. It has five planets so together. So far, it has been, they have been found. So we are finding solar systems or stellar systems similar to our system mostly on the motion of the parent star. Or, or the, but it is also possible to detect the passage of planets in front of the disk of a star. And for this process, we call it a transit. The light curve of the, of the star during a, a planetary transit, it becomes diminished. It, it, it's, it's obscured by a little dot that crosses it. it. This diminishing is very small. It's only about... It's less than 101%. Uh, Sometimes it's about 0.1%. So it's a, a very sl uh, small diminishing of light. It's very difficult to detect it. You have to have very precise instruments. And, and for that, a, a satellite, which was Kepler, was built. It was constructed to detect exoplanets, detecting many images of the same single region on the sky. The same, exactly the same. So it was a, uh, this, is, this is the region where it was set, and it was towards the constellation of Cygnus and Lyra, and they were trying to uh, obtain an image every 30 minutes of the same area of the sky, and eventually to detect a variation in the light of the, sky, of the stars. Uh, actually, it, it, since it's looking at just one section of the sky, it is not covering the whole sky. It's looking at nearby area in, in one fourth, one four hundred part of the night sky. But what has been the result? So far, uh, three years ago, this uh, satellite already had 2,700 candidates of, for, for planets. And these are a representation of the parent stars and the sizes of the planets. So what is the situation 20 years uh, uh, from, uh, well, there's 24 years now, uh, from to, to our present day? I looked at this uh, two days ago. And as of two days ago, there were 3,200 exoplanets found in 2,500 stars, and many of them, about almost 600, are multiple systems. I think this is terribly exciting. I think it's, these are results that we should be happy and delighted about finding them. And uh, uh, there are many methods now to, to find exoplanets, but most of the uh, methods, the most significant ones have been the transit, uh, the, I mean the passage of the, uh, the obscuration of the light by, by the passage of a, a dark spot across the, the face of the star and the radial velocity motions that, that have been the most exciting things. For me, I, f I find it very exciting the way that the astronomy has increased this knowledge and here are some of the uh, web pages that if somebody wants to follow what are the situation of this numerology, I think it's interesting to find this out. Now, okay, so we have exoplanets. We want to learn more about them. And, and of course, most of the central stars are similar to the sun. That's not surprising 
because the sun is a very common star. So, of course, we will find lots of common stars around, the, around ourselves. Most of the star, central stars are close to the solar system. We, we, uh, because we're looking very close to us, most of the planets have periods, uh, short periods. Why? Because the long period planets, we don't have time to find them, to, because we need to have the repeat of the same signal. And, well, let's do some arithmetic. There are about, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking in Spanish, but it's about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And we're, uh, it's estimated that at least 10 billion planets are in our galaxy. And there are billions of planets, of galaxies in the universe. So you can imagine what is the scope of how many exoplanets there might be. And some of them are in, in habitable zones, what are called habitable zones. What do we want to mean by habitable zones? We want areas around the star where there's, there's, there might be water, liquid water. Because if they are too far away from the parent star, the, the water that may be there will be frozen. If they are too close, water will be no longer liquid. So we call it a habitable zone. And, and these are, uh, I'll show you, these, these are the potentially habitable planets, exoplanets that have been found so far out of the 34,000. I mean, there, there might be more, but these have been identified as the possible, potentially habitable planets. The, the image on the right is just for size reference, where you have Neptune, Mars, Earth, etc., just for size reference. So you, you, you know what kind of objects you have there are there. And well, how are they? They are spherical because they are big of their gravitational force. Uh, those that are larger than 100 kilometers in diameter are spherical. And well, in our solar system, the planets shine because they reflect the solar light. And the exoplanets, of course, they also shine because they reflect the central star light. Well, there are many more things to talk about the exoplanets. I will not do that because today I want to show other, other topic and I have to go very, very quickly because I'm already overdoing my time. And I want to talk a bit about star formation. This is also a very exciting, a very exciting topic. Star formation, the star is born, of course. And uh, we, we, when we say about star, we're talking about uh, any of those. But of course, just looking at the star is very boring. It's more exciting to look at star clusters, which there are many images, beautiful images of star clusters. But where do we think that stars are born? We think that stars are born in, in clouds, that dense clouds, dense cold clouds, that we can look at them by, by looking at these dark spots. These dark spots is not that the, the fabric is not broken, is that there's a, a dark cloud ahead in front of, of the, the, this bright uh, set of stars. And we can look at, at the, uh, the, the, the large spot, and here is again a close-up of that, of that area. And this is where stars are born. These are uh, regions where stars are born. Again, another cloud, dark cloud, is not absence of stars. It's a cloud in front of the, the stars. And here is a, an, an image of, of the same region of the sky one in visible light and one in infrared light. I don't know if you recognize, if you can identify that we're talking about the same region, the two images are about the same region in the sky. Are you recognizing it? Or should I point out some of the... Uh, I, I think you can, you can see them if you... Uh, the, the two ears of the rabbit, you can see them. You can identify them. Uh, and of course, in, 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 in visible light, we only see only the stars that are in front. Uh, but in infrared light, we, uh, infrared light penetrates deeper. And then you can see what's inside this dark cloud. And we're looking at stars that are being formed now. 
another cloud, another dark cloud. Astronomers give them very exciting names or, or very significant names. This is Horse Head Nebula. This has been known for a long time. But in, in, the, in the top of the head, it's a, a new star that is being formed. Uh, this is the same region looked uh, in microwave uh, wavelengths in the molecule of mon uh, carbon oxygen monoxide. And this is the same uh, cloud, but now with in the molecular hydrogen gas is by the infrared telescope combined with visible light. And we can see what's all, all the structure that is happening in there. And, and we can see where some of the stars are being born. There are more places, many places on, in our galaxy where stars are being born. And uh, this is Orion Nebula. And here we can see, an, uh, well, let me see. Orion Nebula is where stars have been born. They have been born only recently. It's only three million years ago that they were born. So they are very, very young. They are much younger than all these people that are getting the, 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 these fellowships. They are younger than you, much younger than you. They are only three million years old. And uh, another region of very young stars, three million years old, and, well, this is just a, 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 a figure of the Orion constellation, a picture of the Orion constellation, which you are, you are all acquainted with the Orion constellation, because you have seen three stars in the, in the uh, winter sky. Well, this is the, the belt of Orion, and he's the, the warrior, and you can see the stars in the belt. And, well, let me, let me go through this. This is not, well, I, this is what I want to say. The way, the way we think that stars are born is out of clouds, and that each part of the cloud is, is, is calling each other by, gra by gravity. So it's trying to approach each other, and they condense, and they become smaller. But then, if they have some uh, lateral movement, movement, when they become smaller, then this motion has to be much faster, just like this lady that is a, a, a skater. And now I will show you a film about star formation. You will agree that this is a picture, a, a, picture, a film, and where the, the cloud is uh, getting smaller, but that it has this uh, speed uh, to go around it. And the only way to, to be able to both to contract due to gravitation and both to keep this angular momentum is to propose, is to construct a, a disk around the star, where, and from that disk, the, the planets will form. Eventually, the solar, the, the planetary system will form. This is the same with other figures. I like the, the previous one better, but anyway. And another picture of Orion. I work in Orion, so I always show pictures of Orion, no matter what is the topic, because, well, it's my, my, my field. And here in Orion, and, uh, in some places in, uh, along the, the, the nebula, we can see these strange figures. And we, these are stars that are being formed that have not yet cleared out their, their disk. And these are called proplids, protoplanetary disks in Orion Nebula. And they are trying to condense and clear off the, the disk. And we don't know what's going to happen because they are in very hostile environment. They are, uh, they are being uh, illuminated with ultraviolet light. So we don't know if the star will finally form or if it will uh, evaporate because it's fighting too many fights at the same time. We don't know what's going to happen. It's just a matter for us to come back in 10,000 years, we'll take a picture, and then we will know what will happen to this object. So it's, it's not, not too long. 10,000 years is not long in the in astronomical time scale. Well, other things happen at, at time of star formation. We, we did not expect, expect this, but uh, what, what is happening here, let's look at the bottom image, 
and you can see this extended area. And what happens is that the extended areas, the, the, bot, the, the, the heads of those or the ends of those had been discovered and they were not understood what was going on because they, they, it was understood that there was not a, a single star in the middle of them. But what happened is that there is a central star That little spot is the star that is producing all this brightness because it's ejecting matter out of its poles. And now if you look at the upper picture on the left, we can see what's happening. There, there's a disk and the disk is around the star and the star is ejecting matter around its poles. The astronomers did not expect this to be the case but this is the way the stars do it. We, we just have to explain how they do it. We still do not know how they do it, but it's, it's a sign of a very young star. It's one of the phases that the young stars are undergoing. And this, uh, not only that, uh, here the star is in the middle of the dark hamburger, and uh, we don't see it because the disk is obscuring it. But uh, it's ejecting matter, and in a few years' time, the, this matter is, is changing because it's continuously being ejected dif in different ways. And there are more objects in this, of this type. There are, there are many, many of these objects in the sky. Well, we can also find disks around several stars that can be observed. So there, this already is very thin. This is a, another phase. It became thin. And so we, this is the way now it's, it's accepted that the stars are being formed out of clouds, then the, they condense and, and they be, form a disk and they eject matter on the, on the poles. And from, the, the, from that disk, there's a planetary, well, there's a, a thinner disk and the, from them, the, the, star, the planets are, are being formed. That is what the current status of our understanding of, of star formation. Well, this is uh, in a list. We, I'm not going to give it to you. And let's see what happens here. No. So this is what we expect to see if we want to see a disk of gas and dust. And this is not a picture. This is what the artist decided how to represent this star for this uh, uh, solar system formation or stellar system formation. And then the artists, another artist say, well, but from there planets will form. And if planets will form, they will form out of the disk. And then they will, they will empty a, a, a whole circle. They will make a trough because the planet is, is collecting all this matter. And this is what the artist proposed. And this is what the simulations of numerical simulations are saying that the a star that is forming a disk, how it would appear in ALMA interferometer. ALMA is the Atacama la, large millimeter array, which is an extraordinary array at 5,000 meters in Chile. And this would be on the indicate a planet undergoing formation. Not only a star that has undergone formation, the star has already formed, but it has, it has a proto-solar system, a proto-stellar system, and from there, the planets will come. And this was the proposed simulation. And what happened? In November 2014, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array did indeed observe around one of the stars, HL Tau, that's the name of the star, at 450 light years away. They, found, they can observe, this is the observation. This is extraordinary observation. This is very exciting, and this is what I want to share with you, this exciting result, because not only we're looking at a disk, we're looking at a broken disk, that means that planets are being formed. At least seven planets are being formed there today. I think this is absolutely wonderful. Not only that, but uh, 
if, if they look at that same picture in more detail, then they conclude that maybe where the, where the uh, arrow is pointing, that is also uh, that's a planet that is being formed. So we're looking at many phases, many details in star formation and in planet formation, and these are all recent results, and I think they're all so exciting that I think we, uh, we really are in wonderful times to look at, at them. And thank you, Toba.